general plane motion. So not rotation around a single point, not rotation around an axis, not translational. So this involves translational and rotational motion. And we're going to use this relative velocity analogy in order to solve it. So whenever there's rotational motion, there'll be some point that the rotation is taking part around. And if you can find that point that the rotation is, t is going around, everything else is going to be rotating around it, and the overall motion is going to be a combination of what that center of rotation is doing and what everything else is doing relative to that rotation. So if we want to see what point B is doing here, so point B starts here and it ends up here. And from here to here, that is a combination of translation, so VA plus rotation, velocity of B relative to A. So this would be the rotational piece of it, and this is the translational piece. So the plane motion of any particle on here is translational motion and rotation, and these two add together to, to the overall picture. Okay, so you just have to yeah, find that center of rotation and everything else is going to be a combination of translation plus rotation. And you're just it's just adding these three vectors together. Here's an example with a rolling motion of a tire where it is not slipping on the ground. So not slipping, you're not leaving skid marks around. And what that means is the velocity of this little piece of tire right here at the ground is actually zero. The velocity profile across this wheel, the axle, the center here, is moving at the same velocity that the car is moving in. And the top of the wheel is actually moving faster. So for this wheel, that's the velocity. And you get that <clears throat> from adding together the translational motion of the center of that wheel plus the rotational motion. So if you look at that rotational motion, the top is going to the right, the bottom is going to the left. So you see these two guys cancel out to get you that zero while the tops add together and you get this long velocity along the top. And it doesn't have to be a wheel, so just any random shape, okay? So if you're looking at VB, and draw out the vectors for this equation. So VB is VA plus B relative to A. So just head to tail, head to tail, add those vectors together, and you will get the velocity of each piece of it. So translation and then rotation. And remember the velocity from the rotation, because you need the directions of these vectors to add them together, that velocity is tangential. So it's at right angles to the radius of rotation. That'll give you what direction this relative velocity vector is. But take this equation, this relative motion equation, draw those vectors out, and just Make sure you draw each little piece of this so that you can see what angles are going on for each piece of it. Okay, if you can get the, the relative pieces of it, you can also use this omega cross r. So you can, you can substitute that relative motion. So remember the relative motion is always the rotational motion of what you're looking at. Okay, before I uncover this, see if you can figure out what the translational and rotational motion would be to fully describe what this falling bar is doing. So we have this side B is going straight down, so there's the vector for VB. The A is going straight out, so let's say we want to describe VB, and we say VB equals VA plus B relative to A. So what would those vectors look like? Here you go. So VB equals VA plus B relative to A. Let's just draw those vectors out. So head to tail, head to tail, we have B 
going straight down, and b is equal to a plus b relative to a. What is this angle in here? Can you find that angle? So you're coming up here, and you know that the relative velocity, this is the rotational velocity, and it is perpendicular to that bar. So that is where that angle is coming from. So here you have theta, 90 minus theta, theta again. So hopefully you can see where that, that angle is right there. So really, for this equation, don't just write the equation. Draw out each of those vectors. And a lot of times, the geometry of the problem will get, give you information on the direction of those velocities. So whether it's sliding along a floor or it's fixed axis rotation, there'll be something that allows you to figure out the direction of those vectors so that you can draw these triangles and figure out what's going on with them. Okay, just thinking about those angles a little bit more. So tangent is opposite over adjacent. You look at this VB over VA. So you can relate them just through that angle if you want to. Or if you look at cosine of that angle, so cosine is going to be VA over V relative velocity. And that relative velocity, remember, that's the rotational velocity. So V equals R omega. So R in this case is L. And then omega would be how fast it's rotating. So this is the angular velocity, radians per second. That's the relative velocity is R omega or L omega. That's cosine. So if you want to find the radial velocity, you can do that as well through that angle. But it all stems back to this triangle. If you can just draw this triangle and keep track of which way those velocities are happening, and then remember the relative, this rotational relative velocity is at 90 degrees to whatever it's rotating around. Okay, here's another way that you can add those vectors together, and that is by breaking everything up into their i, j, k components. So let's start out and just consider velocity a, so it is entirely in the i direction, 0, j. b is sliding down the, the wall, so it's negative in the negative j direction. And we also need to break up this rotational velocity, this relative v, B relative to A into its I and J components. So if he is coming down and to the left, that would be, and just cosine and sine, so Katoa. So cosine is the adjacent side, that's the I component, and then the opposite side is your sine theta. So remember V equals R omega, and you're just breaking that into its I and J components. Okay, so once you have all of your i and j components, now we're going to split up this equation into i and j components. So here's everything in the i direction. So we have b equals a plus b relative to a, but we're just looking at all the i components here. So b, which has 0i, is equal to a, which is all in the i direction, minus, and here's that i component of the relative velocity. So seeing that, z, that zero in here, you see that the velocity of a is completely equal to that wL cosine theta. Okay, so here is the velocity of b, and these guys are all in the j direction now. So if we look at what contribution j is for b, Okay, so everything is in the j direction. This is the one that's just sliding down the wall. So it's a negative bj, and that's going to be equal to the a component, but a doesn't have anything in the j direction, right? So its j component is 0. And then this relative velocity, the rotational one, that was the opposite of that angle. So that's the sine piece that you're adding together. And because of that, zero, you see that VBJ ends up being omega L sine theta. So whether you like, and this is just like breaking forces into IJ components and you add everything in the I direction together and you add everything in the J direction. 
it's the same thing, only instead of forces, you're doing that with velocity. So you look at everything in the i direction and everything in the j direction and add it together that way if you don't want to go through and walk through the triangle. Okay, here is another way to think about this. What if we say VA? VA is equal to VB with A relative to B. So here we go. VA is skidding along the ground in the positive x direction. B is sliding down the wall over here. And the relative velocity is now it's relative to B. So we would consider B to be fixed and have A rotating up relative to B. And it's, it's the same triangle. We are just adding B plus this relative velocity. So the direction of this relative velocity has flipped if we're looking at it with respect to A. So either way works equ equally well for this. And once again, you're going to walk around and figure out what the angle is, knowing that that relative velocity is tangent to the rotation. So L is the radius, and the velocity is perpendicular to that radius. Okay, so these are the, this is a comparison of those two triangles. So whether you're looking at VB is VA plus VB relative to A, or VA is equal to VB plus the relative velocity. And you see everything in these two triangles is the same except for this relative velocity chunk of it. Walking through this system again, hopefully you can see that swapping around where we're taking this rotation with respect to, it doesn't matter. So whether you're looking at B with respect to A or A with respect to B, the direction is the same, the angle is the same, the magnitude is the same, and it's, it's really, it's this entire beam that's rotating. So whether you take the rotation around B or point A or around the center of the thing, you're still going to get that same omega. So you can go through these angles, the angle is going to be opposite over adjacent, B over A again, and you'll end up with the same rotational velocity either way. So whether you're going from A or you're going from B, the magnitude of this guy is going to be the same, and that rotation, this rotation is independent of where you're going to take that rotation around. Okay, so once again, yeah, the big point here is Angular velocity is not dependent on the choice of the reference point. So whether we were going from point B or point A, you would calculate the same omega. So it's just, it's the entire bar that's rotating. And it doesn't matter where you try and measure that from. Here's another sample problem. So what we have here is a double gear, so two gears, gear A and gear B. We've got the two radiuses, and they are rolling on a stationary lower rack. Okay, so this lower rack is stationary. It's not moving. It's connected to the ground. This thing is not moving, and we know the velocity of the center. So here's the velocity of the center, 1.2 meters per second. And we need to find the angular velocity of the gear. Okay, so the angular velocity of the gear, that's that omega. How fast the angle is changing with time, d theta dt for the gear. And the velocity of the upper rack, okay, so this upper rack, r, this thing is moving. The lower rack is stationary, but the upper rack is moving. So that would be equivalent to finding the velocity of this point B. That would be the velocity of the upper rack. And we want to find the velocity of point D of the gear. Okay, so what's the, what's the velocity of point D? How are we going to go about doing this? Well, all of these are going to come from this relative velocity equation. 
we're going to look at everything with respect to A because that's the piece that's only going through translational motion and no rotation. So A is going just straight down in straight translational motion. And then anything that's some distance away from A, it's going to be a combination of what A is doing and then that point with respect to A. So whether we're looking at D, so D will be the translational motion of A plus rotation about A. Or B, B is going to be what A is doing and then the added velocity from that extra rotation. So the first thing we should solve for here is our angular velocity. Okay, so how are we going to solve for angular velocity? How would we do that? Let me just draw in some curves here. So remember, for a tire that's not slipping, and this is a gear, so it's not slipping, that means the velocity of this point over here is zero. And it kind of acts like the entire wheel is rotating around this point right here, this point C, if that makes sense. And we can get the angular velocity by just taking this radius here times this velocity is equal to r omega. Okay, so the velocity of A, the 1.2 meters per second, that's going to be equal to this large radius, 150 meters, times r omega. So we can figure out our omega by just v over r. v equals r omega or but hopefully you can see that, that it's, it's like this entire thing is rotating around C. And what, we'll actually go through this. It's called the instantaneous center of rotation. So even though A seems like the, the center of rotation, for this instant in time, this is really the point that everything is rotating around. So B equals our omega. We get what our omega is. And then we can take this omega and plug it in to find what the velocity of D is, and then also what the velocity of B is. Okay, so here's that relative velocity equation again. We're going to do translational motion. That's what A is doing. This is the translational motion. Add to it rotation around A, and the combination of that translational motion and the rotational motion, that's going to give us the velocity of any point on here. So let's try it out for this upper rack R. So the rack has the same velocity as B, and that's going to be the velocity of A, so the translational motion of A, and the rotational motion about A. So we were able to find that omega radians per second, our angular velocity. And now all we have to do is just plug in our radius. So our radius here would be 100 millimeters and that is our overall velocity for the rack. And you'll notice this is, it's a little bit faster than what A is going. So point B, it's going forward with A, but then that rotational motion gives it just a little bit a larger velocity when you get up here to B. Whereas down here at C, those velocities, that rotational motion cancels out, so VC is equal to zero. So there is the velocity of the rack, 2 meters per second in the I direction. How about the velocity of point D over here? Same thing, only now we have stuff going not just in the I direction, but we have the I direction and the rotational, this relative motion, the tangent. Remember that, that rotational motion that's always tangent, so it's going straight up in the j direction. And that's going to add together, so it's partly in the i direction, so this is going forward with a. And then this j direction, this is the, the relative r omega piece of it. So r omega, and this is k cross i, which gives you that positive j velocity for our relative motion. So there's the velocity of d. And the direction of that thing is a combination of A going forward and D rotating around A. Okay, so just thinking through this thing, 
you can see the velocity profile going on for this tire. And tires are kind of good examples because rotational motion, you're always going to have this kind of a stuff going on. So you can always sort of trim it down into some sort of a tire. So there's the overall velocity profile going on. So it's zero at the bottom because there's no slipping occurring. There's the velocity of A. And then the rack up at the top is going faster. And the interesting thing for point D over here, it is actually tangent to C. So if you do this instantaneous center of rotation thing and draw a radius from C to D, the velocity of D is going to be perpendicular to that radius. So it really, the entire thing really does act like it's rotating around this point where it contacts the ground over here. Here's another example problem. So what we have is a crank, here's a connecting rod and a piston. Crank AB has a constant clockwise angular velocity of 2,000 RPM. Okay, so AB, this is fixed axis rotation here. Okay, so B is the velocity of B is going to be tangent to this radius, and we have an angular velocity here. For the crank position indicated, find the angular velocity of the connecting rod, BD, and the velocity of the piston p okay so for all of these problems start on the side that you know the most about we know the most about this little piece here we can figure out vb and then work your way over to the piece that you don't know let's just start with a b the part that we know so this is fixed axis rotation we're rotating around a our radius is 3 inches, so what is the velocity of B? So B equals R omega, and we can figure out both the magnitude and the direction of the velocity at B. So remember that this velocity is perpendicular to the radius, and we need both the magnitude and the direction if we're going to add all of these vectors together. Okay, for part D, we know a lot about D because this is constrained to move along the floor, right? So the velocity of D is going to be entirely in the I direction. So that's another key point of information to kind of pay attention to. If we do this relative motion equation, so what we have is the velocity of D is equal to the velocity of B plus the relative velocity of d relative to b. So here's our vector equation. d is equal to b plus d relative to b. So if we know what b is, this is what b is. It's tangent. And we know what this, this is what one of the problem statements asked, was what was the angular velocity of this connecting rod. So the velocity of d relative to b Relative to B, that means it's going to be like it's rotating around this point B. So this would be the R. And the relative velocity, the direction of that is going to be perpendicular to the connecting rod. So here is our triangle. We have D is scooting along on the floor entirely in the I direction. We have B and the direction of B is coming down tangent to that arm, and then D relative to B, that is perpendicular to this little guy. Okay, so if you can figure out all of the angles in this triangle, and we know one of the sides of the triangle because we know how fast this is rotating, and so you can figure out what BB is, Okay, so if you know one of the sides of the triangle and you can figure out all of these other angles, then you can figure out what rotation is going on and you can figure out the velocity of that piston. So hopefully you see how important it is to take this equation, draw out the vectors for it, and then draw some nice big pictures so that you can figure out all of the angles that are going on here. So here's V equals R omega. This is the velocity of B. And 
we have to go from revolutions per minute to radians per second. So keep track of your units on here. So there's the velocity of B, right? It's just our radius times. So here's AB, which is three inches. And there's our omega. And there's the velocity of B. And here's the direction. So if this is 40 degrees, that would make this guy 50 degrees. Okay, so make sure to yeah draw large pictures so that you can get all of those angles in there correctly. Here's the next piece. We have to get this relative velocity and the direction of this relative velocity. So how do we figure out this angle? So we have three inches, we have 40 degrees, we have eight inches. What we can do, this little blue line, we can figure out the height of this triangle. So 3 sine 40, it's just the opposite side of that 40. So there's the height of that triangle, and that is also the height of this 8 inch long triangle, right? So we can figure out that angle beta. Sometimes the problem statements, they just, they won't give you all the information. They make you really think about how to get the angles and figuring out what the angles are in these things. That's, that's going to be the hardest part of it. Okay, so here's D, here's our 50 degrees, here's B coming down, so that's this guy right here at 50 degrees, and if you walk around all these crazy triangles, you can figure out what direction this relative velocity is going at too, and that comes from this angle beta right here. He shows up over here again. So once you have all three angles and you have one of the sides, you have the velocity of B from B equals R omega. So you know one side and all the angles, you can figure out the rest of that triangle. So you remember law of sines or law of cosines? Which one would you use? This is a law of sines, right? So sine 40 over eight inches, sine beta three, you can find what beta is. And here's our velocities. So again, once you know one side of the triangle and all the angles, you can figure out all the rest of that triangle. So just draw big pictures, draw each part of that equation. So VD equals VB plus the rotational motion. And without these pictures, it's sometimes very hard to find the directions of those velocities. And you really have to figure out those directions. So here's VD is equal to VB head to tail, head to tail, plus that relative velocity on there. Okay, and once you have the velocity, V equals R omega, so you can get omega of that connecting rod. Okay, so if I was to put a similar problem like this to the test, what would happen if instead of 40 degrees, if this little guy was down here or over here, would you be able to solve the same problem for all of the different instants in time? And hopefully you would be able to. Here we go. In the position shown, bar AB has an angular velocity of 4 radians per second clockwise. Determine the angular velocity of bars BD and DE. Okay, so AB is going around clockwise. Which one would be true? Okay, so let's just draw in that circular path. B, the velocity of B is going to be tangent to that curve, which ends up being straight up. How about D? What's the direction that D is going to be in? Sometimes it really does help to draw in that entire circular path and then you can really see what direction is tangent. Okay, so if B is going straight up, velocity of D is equal to velocity of B plus D relative to B. So what does this equation look like on here? Can you draw in the vectors for it? So here we go. D is equal to B 
plus d relative to b. So that's like it's rotating around b. So if you add these two together, d is going to be also tangent to e. So these two motions are going to add together to something that is tangent to rotating around e. Okay, so let's go ahead and actually plug in some numbers to this question. So here we go. In the position shown, bar AB has an angular velocity of 4 radians per second, and we're going clockwise. Determine the angular velocity of BD and then DE. Remember, for these problems, we're going to start with the piece we know the most about and then just work our way down and then pay attention to how the motion is constrained just by things like constant axis rotation. So we know the direction of the velocity at D has to be tangent to rotating around E. And we know that B is straight up because we are rotating around A. So here's the equation again that we're using and we need to figure out the directions of all of these velocities if we're going to add those vectors together. So let's go ahead and figure out what B is. So velocity of B is equal to just omega cross R. So 4k cross 7i, so that's just the length of this beam here is the radius. So there's the velocity of B. It's going straight up in the j direction. Okay, so let's plug in a few numbers on this. We're going to split everything up into x and y components. So here's our vector analysis. So we have the velocity at point D down here. So here's D. And remember, D is going tangent to this circle around E. And we're going to get to that velocity also by going through VB and the relative velocity of d with respect to b. So if we add together what b is doing, and remember b is straight up in the j direction, and then the rotation relative to b, this is going to be right in the i direction. So if we're rotating the bar around b, and these two vectors are going to add together to what d is overall doing. So you can walk through seven, four, three, you can figure out the angle over here of this bar ED. And if you know this angle, then you can get the direction that D is going in. So this ends up being 74.74 degrees. And then you can use that to split D into its I and J components. So cosine is adjacent to that angle. That's going to be the I component. And then it goes up positive in the j direction, that's going to be the sine piece of it. Okay, so the velocity of d we have split into ij components. b is straight up, just all in the j direction. And then this relative velocity over here, which is omega cross r, that's going to be completely in the i direction. Okay, so let's just look at everything in the x direction and then everything in the y direction. Just like splitting forces into x and y components, only instead of forces, we're splitting velocities into x and y components. Okay, so VD in the i direction, and remember that's over here, that's going to be that cosine piece of it. So here's VD in the i direction. That's going to be the i component of the, of the v, VB, and there's, that's going to be zero, okay? So VB in the I direction is zero because it's all the way up. And then we have this relative piece of it. And the relative piece of it is entirely in the I direction, and that's created by how this bar is rotating. So omega BD, the angular velocity, d theta dt for BD, and it is completely in the i direction. So that's, this is everything in the i direction, and you can relate the velocity of d to that rotation of that bar. Okay, so that's the x direction. Now let's split everything in the y direction. Again, we're just walking through this, the vector analysis. So 
VD, which piece of that is in the Y direction now? So that's going to be the sine piece of it, right? That's opposite to this angle. So we've just split that velocity into X direction and Y direction. So there's the sine piece. That's VD in the J direction. And then for B, B is entirely straight up. And we, we found out what B was doing by just that R omega again. So that ends up being 28 straight up. And that relative velocity, d relative to b, there's nothing in the j direction. There's nothing going straight up and down. It's all in the i direction. So that's 0. So now we have d as a function of 28. So here we can, we can solve for vd here, right? And then once we have vd, we can come back here and we can find what our omega is. So I just plugged this into Mathematica, but it's not that hard to do by hand. You just solve for the velocity of d, and then you plug it in, and you can use that to find the rotation of the bar. So here we go. Solving for vd, it ends up being 29.03. So that was just off of this equation. So you're just looking at 28 divided by sine 74. So there's our velocity, and once we have that, we're going to come up here, plug in our radius, and there's our angular velocity. So that's radians per second right there. Okay, so once you have the angular velocity of BD, we can also come down here and figure out what the angular velocity of DE is doing. Okay, so once again, if you know this velocity, that velocity is equal to omega cross r. We know what the radius is. We know what the velocity is. So it's pretty quick that we can get but what our angular velocity for dE is doing. So that's, that's all the pieces for that problem. Okay, so hopefully that wasn't too crazy. But just remember, it's, it's walking around that vector analysis. Remember, velocities come from the cross product and splitting everything into i and j components sometimes that's the easiest thing to do on here okay hopefully that wasn't too horrendous let me know if there's any other specific examples that you would like to see worked out for this and remember that it all comes from velocity equals translational plus rotational motion if you can just break it into translational and rotational pieces of it, you'll be good to go.